those of you who are in person, uh, reminded for those of you who are guests or first time, first time guests or coming back after a time away, there are um, little cards in the queue in front of you so you can uh, give us contact information so we can personally welcome you to St. Paul. And thank you for those who are watching on, on your devices. And I'll make sure that you can always uh, put in a note um, in the chat function at, on Facebook and we can um, make sure we see you and uh, recognize you as well. Um, last Thursday was Veterans Day, so we do want to honor veterans after after great jokes. We will have a time for um, a thank you for our veterans, and so we will uh, have a prayer over all veterans. So, um, make sure you're kind of getting ready to stand up um, so we can recognize you for your service. Our flowers today on the altar are given by Lonnie Zip in appreciation of her daughter Julie and appreciation of the property ministry. So thank you, Bonnie, and thank you, uh, Julie, and the property ministry teams here at St. Paul. Um, next Sunday, we're going to have Stewardship Sunday, a time to give your um, intent for giving for 2022. You should be receiving um, the paperwork in the mail this week. We will pray over and then bring back uh, next Sunday. All right, it looks like you're ready. Good morning. Good morning. We have one birthday this week, and Wednesday it's Dennis Knight. And so, Dennis, I hope you have a blessed day every day, and, and uh, we wish you a happy birthday. Community Meals served 71 meals this past Tuesday, and the Food Pantry served 70 families yesterday. And we'd like to continue to thank all the volunteers who give up their time to keep these things up and running. Pastor Ashley's e-blast this week talks about our new parish administrator, Olfa Reyes. So stop in and, or call and introduce yourself to her. World Kindness Day, Sarasota, and Team St. Paul Lutheran's Walk and, and Alzheimer's are, are also mentioned. And issues with getting communion kits and how it's affecting us as a con congregation. So there's more, so be sure to check it out. And don't forget Making Joyful Noise by John Ferrer. It's a short and entertaining video about the hymns for each Sunday. Thank you, John. Either Sue or I make it a point to listen every week. A week, week is not complete until we listen. And if Sue listens first, she tells me about it. <laughs> Some ministry opportunities this week. Meeting today in the Fellowship Hall after our service is Sunday School, a group that reflects on today's worship service, readings, sermon, and whatever else. Community meal at 5.30 on Tuesday. Wednesday we have property at 8 a.m., Bible study at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, and also on Wednesday, bell practice at 6 p.m. and choir at 7 p.m. Thursday at 4 p.m., we have St. Paul Prayers entitled Talking with God, Food Pantry Bagging on Friday at 9.30 a.m., and Distribution on Saturday at 9 a.m. Up and coming and ongoing. We will be having coffee fellowship today after the service, so come have coffee while we'll enjoy Sunday school and fellowship. We distributed everything yesterday at Food Pantry, so there isn't anything to peruse or take home. Hope Seeds tomorrow from 1 to 3 p.m. All are welcome, so please come and join us to socialize, have fun, and make a difference in the world. The Walk to End Alzheimer's, Saturday, November 20th at Ed Smith Stadium. Uh, starts the ceremony, uh, registration is at 8 a.m. ceremony at 8.30 a.m. and the walk at 9 a.m. It is a two-mile walk. There's no cost to participate, but a personal donation and soliciting sponsors is encouraged. So uh, if enough people express an interest in St. Paul, we can register as a team. We already have a few members. So contact Debbie Radio if you're interested, and or go to the website for more information of alz.org. We are going to be serving Thanksgiving dinner in the Fellowship Hall this Thanksgiving. This will be a potluck type meal with turkey and some of the fixings provided. 
There is a sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall, so please, if you have not signed up, please do, so we know uh, how many people to expect. Um, we will be serving the food at different stations with someone serving you the food to minimize contact with serving utensils. And our head server is going to be John Ferrero. He's going to be gracious about it and have a smile on his face. <laughs> And now, Forrest Gump and St. Peter. When Forrest Gump died, he stood in front of St. Peter at the pearly gates. St. Peter said, welcome, Forrest. We've heard a lot about you. He continued, unfortunately, it's getting pretty crowded up here, and we find that we now have to give people an entrance exam before we let them in. Okay, said Forrest, I hope it's not too hard. I've already been through a test. My mama used to say, life is like a final exam, it's hard. <laughs> yes, of course, I know, but this test is only three questions. Here they are. One, which two weeks, two days of the week begin with the letter T? Two, how many seconds of the year? Three, what is God's first name? <laughs> well, sir, said Forrest, the first one is easy. Which two days of the week begin with the letter T? Today, today and tomorrow. St. <laughs> Peter looked surprised and said, well, that wasn't the answer I was looking for at all, but you have a point. I'll give you credit for that. The next question said for us, how many seconds in a year? Twelve. Twelve, said St. Peter, surprised and confused. Yes, January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd. St. <laughs> Peter interrupted and I said, see what you mean. I'll have to give you credit for that one, too. And the last question. What is God's first name? It's Andy. Andy said St. Peter and Chuck. How did, how did you come up with that? Andy? I learned it in church. We used to sing about it. Forrest broke into song. Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. Andy tells me I am his own. St. Peter opened the gate to heaven and said, Run, Forrest, run. <laughs>
these minds as you're able for the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. I invite us to a time of silence and reflection.
Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast in the homes of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated for our special music by St. Paul Singer. Some to everlasting life, 
and some to shame and everlasting content. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Word of God, word of light. Thanks be to God. The song of this morning is uh, Psalm 16. We'll read it responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied.
last week, this song reminded me of a favorite song from my college years, The King of Glory by Third Day. And then earlier this week, I opened up the email from John, our music director, with the hymns for today, and our dad room song was another favorite of my college years, Here I Am to Worship. John didn't know this when he picked the song out, but this song was pretty influential, solidifying what I believe theologically and being okay with it. As many of you probably know, I grew up a Lutheran Christian, very active in my home congregation. A shout out to those of you who are watching online from Minnesota. I went to college in Northwest Wisconsin and was involved in many Christian campus ministries. Some were Lutheran and some were not. I learned about different denominations and theologies and really started a field as a called a pastoral ministry. But some of the campus ministries that I was a part of didn't believe women could be called to be a pastor. So I struggled with my call versus the Bible. I graduated college and went on to seminary, still questioning the call and how it fits with the Bible. In my first year of seminary, I began to understand my beliefs and how my call can fit with the Bible. And for my first year in seminary, I went on to what is called Clinical Pastoral Education, or CPE. It's a time when I served as a chaplain in a hospital. I did my CPE near my college town, so I stayed on my college campus for CPE. I still had friends in town, and we went back to the same congregations I attended during college. And then at one church, this song, Here I Am to Worship, was played. I knew the song as it was popular in my college days, but for the first time, I was able to accept and celebrate my theology of God's call to me as a pastor and the Bible. I was able to worship and bow down and say that, yes, you are my God. You are altogether lovely, altogether worthy, and altogether wonderful. I remember trying to explain it to someone, and they didn't get it, but that was okay. It was for me and my growth as a Christian. I could finally meld my passion and excitement for Jesus that I found in non Lutheran worship settings, and my theology and understanding of who this awesome God is that I believe Lutheran Christians have a particular witness and story to share. Lutheran Christians particular witness, I believe, can read our scriptures for today and find comfort in them. And even find comfort in the tumultuous days we are experiencing in 2021, as a world, as a nation, and even as individuals. It's not really easy right now for most folks. Last week, we observed All Saints Sunday, and that isn't an easy day to think of those who have lost. We can have a lot of questions around this world. Why things are happening? Are we in the end times? One scholar wrote, pandemics reveal the fragility of life and the world. Pandemics indicate chaos. Pandemics create paralyzing anxiety that the world is dissolving. They can produce a sense of detachment or raise significant issues of meaning, resulting in an existential crisis. These crises inspire big questions of who and how we are in the world. They likewise inspire big questions of in whom we believe and the shape that that belief takes in practice. Our belief can be found in the letter from Hebrews. It says that we are to approach God with a true heart and hold fast to the confession of our hope in Jesus. Provoke one another to love and good deeds and to continue to gather together, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of others. When I finally reconcile my understanding of God and can worship with my whole self, I realized, as another scholar did too, that I didn't 
come to worship just for myself and my personal learnings or my personal growth. Worship is about and a part of service for the sake of the others. We gather both in person and virtually for one another. You don't know the positive effect you may have on someone just by being in worship. And that is for everyone, even down to the smallest child. Last Sunday, we had the most people in church we had since the pandemic started. We ran out of community kids at the door by the time everyone got in. And even this week, well, some of you are maybe getting grape juice instead of wine because we have have more grape juice than wine available. And I really did try. I tried changing the, uh, some water into wine, and it didn't work for me. So sorry about grape juice uh, for those of you uh, that normally get wine. And even last week, we had some baby whimpering and cooing and fussing going on. And every time I heard that, I smiled. And then I looked up, and I could see others looking around in a joyous way. They weren't giving glares. They were so happy to hear the little babies in church. Our newest baptized for All Saints Day. And for those of you who worship online, thank you. You are also making a difference in our lives. I love going to our Facebook page after worship and seeing the comments that are made, the emoji hearts and the praying hands and the messages shared during real time during worship. I encourage you, especially those of you who are in person, take a look back at our Facebook page. You can see all the people who are worshiping in, in real time and see their messages and their prayers. And then those of you who are worshiping out loud, but later on during, those week, during the week, and we may not know who you're watching, but we see the views clicking up every week, every day. By the end of the week, we see numbers. But know that you're not just a number. You are a person who took time to worship. All of these wonderful ways to be able to worship now, both in person and virtually. Our gospel story, I think, really connects to life in 2021. Jesus and his disciples were coming out of the temple. Now the temple of Jesus' day, according to historians and scholars, was an awe-inspiring wonder. Newly reconstructed by Herod the Great, the temple's retaining walls were composed of stones 40 feet long. The temple itself occupied a platform twice as large as the Roman Forum and four times as large as the Athenian Acropolis. Herod reportedly used so much gold to cover the outside walls that anyone who gazed at them in bright sunlight missed blinding their sight. Accordingly, the disciple and the story is impressed and tries to share his sense of awe with Jesus. But Jesus isn't dazzled. Instead, he responds to the disciples' remark with a question, do you see these great buildings? Why would Jesus ask the disciple if he can see what the disciple has just invited Jesus to see? Aren't the two of them seeing the same thing? Well, no, they're not. They're not seeing the same thing at all. What the disciple sees is an architectural marvel, yes, but it's also the biggest and boldest and most unshakable symbol of God's presence that he's capable of imagining. For him, those massive stones hold religious memory. They bolster a people's identity. They offer the faithful a potent symbol of spiritual glory, of pride, and worthiness. In short, what takes the disciples' breath away as he gazes at the temple is the religious certainty and permanence those glittering stones display to the world. That's what the disciple sees. But what does Jesus see? Father asked. He sees ruins. He sees rubble and destruction. Fragility, not permanence. Loss, not glory. Change, not stability. Not one stone will be left here upon another. Jesus tells the stunned disciple, all will be thrown down. And he invites them to look beyond the grandeur of the temple and recognize that God will not be contained. 
The temple is not the epicenter of God's saving work. God is not bound by mortar or stone. God exceeds every edifice, every institution, every mission statement, every strategic plan, and every symbol human beings create in his name. And that's all because humans create. We have generations of people that don't find God saving love in a building or through what we call the church. I hear and often use the word disillusion when it comes to those who don't worship in a building. They may be disillusioned with the institution of the church. One of my favorite preachers, Barbara Brown Taylor, argues that disillusionment is essential to the Christian life. Disillusionment is literally the loss of an illusion about ourselves, about the world, about God. And while it is almost always a painful thing, it is never a bad thing to lose the lies we have mistaken for the truth. This disillusionment often comes from being hurt by the church somehow. We can equate church or church people with God, and when church or church people hurt us, we want nothing to do with it, and so we may think we want nothing to do with God. And that's a false equivalence that we as a church need to point out and try to overcome with love. One of the prayers of the church today that the assistant minister will pray is to bless faithful people everywhere with humility as they extend compassion to those who have experienced harm in religious spaces. And then we as a congregation respond, cultivate healthy congregations that tell of and enact their reconciling love. One of my passions is for disillusioned people. That's why I'm interested in our St. Paul Youth Group alumni. Demographically, they are around my age, and I want to hear their stories and share God's love to help remind them that this congregation loves them too. Whether we are disillusioned with church or disillusioned with the world or even just questioning what all is going on lately, I love just saying, no, things are not getting worse. Things are getting uncovered. So let's hold each other tight as we pull back the veil. Each year I get a word of the year. Last year was grace, this year, perseverance. In a time when it is easy to despair or grow numb or let exhaustion win, this is a time we persevere and we spawn with Jesus' resilient, healing love. We hear Jesus' words of do not be alarmed. The end times end with the Messiah. He's not here yet. It's not the end. Thanks be to God. Each week we take a time of reflection after the message. And so we have a reflection question today of who are the disillusioned people? How am I to help them? This is a time for reflection, and we'll also be reflecting on that question during the Sunday school that is after worship in the fellowship hall. our hymn of the day, Lord, let my heart be good soil. You heard it as part of the prelude this morning as well. We will sing through it.
God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our practice is to have a spiritual communion prayer for those of you who are watching um, on your devices since you do not physically eat of Jesus' body and blood at this time. Let us pray. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Amen. This is a time where we take our Holy Communion elements. We don't open them yet. This is, we'll open them later in the liturgy, but this is a time when we look them up during the Word of Institution for Blessing. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus of bread, Gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. Gave thanks, gave for all to bring, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray as we sing and sign the love. Mm -hmm. Thank 
the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please rise as you're able for the blessing. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.